Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost. And then that sort of gives me an idea that it's a gift of the Spirit. When it says, he was filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him, and said, O full of all subtility and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And he's talking about this sorcerer who's following him, who's caused him a hard time. And he says, and now, and I think this is actually an example of where two gifts are involved. You know, nobody said that when the gifts are a manifestation that you only have one of them. Chances are you can have a multiple of them. Because Paul discerned that this person was certainly speaking from the standpoint of the devil. So that's a discerning of spirits. And then he says, And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a midst of the darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. So that is an example of a miraculous power, a dunamis, a miracle that takes place. Along with the fact he discerned this man had an evil spirit. So I think that discerning the spirits can discern good and bad character in people. A gift of the spirit can do that. It can also discern between God's spirit and evil spirits. And I think that it can also discern between truth and error. But keeping in mind that it's a fragment as well. So if you're discerning between truth and error, you're not going to have, quote, a gift of discerning of spirits and be able to know proper doctrine from improper doctrine and be able to sit there and write a book about it. It's only a fragment. Sometimes it'll operate, for instance, when you're hearing somebody speak and the insides of you do a flip-flop. I don't know if you've experienced that, but I certainly have. When somebody starts speaking, uh, I can remember one time particularly, uh, and the inside of me just did a flip flop. It didn't want to. The inside of me didn't want to be there. Well, you I think that's Obama. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's a good example. I feel uh, it. I don't know of any Christian, and I mean to my knowledge, who's really walking with God that thinks, "quote Everything is right with Obama." Mm-hmm. there's certainly something wrong with him. And that could be a gift of discerning his spirits, discerning his character or the evil intents that are behind him. Now, we can talk about some of those that are even the more controversial. Tongues, glossialia, and the interpretation of tongues. What is that? Well, tongues is a supernatural ability to speak in an unknown language without learning it beforehand. And it can be a language of men or of angels. Now, if you read modern commentaries, they're going to tell you that it's an unknown human language. But they often overlook the fact that it says in the 14th chapter of Corinthians, he that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks unto himself and unto God. And then it goes on in it to speak that there's a language of angels. Now, nobody, of course, would know what a language of angels were. But obviously God does. And that's where the gift of interpretation comes in. And interpretation is a spiritual fragment, again, of an ability to interpret or translate what the person is speaking to an audience. In Corinthians, the 14th chapter, it will tell you that if one speaks in tongues, it should be only by two or three in a meeting, and that interpreted. Now, that doesn't mean that the person who's speaking in a tongue cannot also interpret it. He can. But 
the quote rules of order are if there's an assembly that should only be done no more than three times and there's also a place in the 14th chapter of Corinthians which I think is important that comes into these particularly these vocal gifts is that it states that the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet now what does that mean that means that even though the Holy Spirit manifests the charismatic gift, it is always subject to the person who is uh, gifted or the gift is coming through. All right, what do I mean? Well, let's take, uh, there's a portion of Christianity who think that speaking <clears throat> speaking in tongues is uncontrollable, that they can do so when it happens, it comes on them, and there's no stopping it, and they just blurt out in the middle of everything and just go to town. Now, that doesn't mean that there's an evil spirit. They could very well be speaking in tongues, but it is out of order. Because the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet, meaning that, Speaking in tongues is subject to the person speaking in tongues. Or else it would not say, let it be by two or at the most by three. That implies the fact that it could be done more often. Meaning that if it's done three times and somebody else has a tongue and an interpretation, they should hold it. Implying, therefore, that the fact that tongues and the interpretation of tongues are subject to the person who has it, which it is. Um, even words of knowledge, words of wisdom, prophecy. What is prophecy? Prophecy, we mentioned earlier, is speaking the counsel of God. Basically, what does God have on his heart? And we'll find in... Um, I think it's the 14th chapter of Corinthians, the third verse, maybe the 23rd through 25 also. It talks about prophecy is to encourage, to edify, and to exhort. And it may also be coupled with words of knowledge or words of wisdom. The In the body of Christ... I like to think about a word of knowledge like this. A word of knowledge may be the name of Modius, which actually could be argued that it's discerning of spirits, but let's just say it's a word of knowledge. It's a fragment of God's knowledge. And let's say that discerning of spirits is a little bit more complicated, that maybe it's a visionary example of what's there. So let's say what prophecy... What was that? Yeah. Some kind of feedback. Hmm. It's gone now. It's not there now? No. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, totally took my um, thought away. Oh. Talking about um, prophecy can, could combine words of knowledge, words of wisdom, and is subject, of course, to the person who's who's operating in it. Now, it also brings up the the question about what tongues or glossiella is in a, in effect. Well, I can give you only a personal example there. Three examples in the book of Acts where people were filled with the Holy Spirit and it says that they prophesied and spoke in tongues. And I can remember I was sitting in a restaurant one night and I finished eating and went outside and this little fellow comes running after me. And he says, do you know the Lord? And I said, well, certainly. And he looked like he was dumbfounded, like, well, how come God sent me running out here in my bare feet to talk to you? <laughs> and so we got to talking, and it was sort of like this example in the book of Acts, 
where the apostles run into these Christians, and uh, they ask them if they have been baptized in the Holy Ghost. And they said, no, we don't. I'm paraphrasing this, by the way. But they said, no, we don't. We've not even heard of any such. We've only been baptized in the baptism of John. And so he goes, goes. The, the story goes forth, and they speak in tongues and prophesy. And there are three instances of that in the book of Acts. And one incident where it mentions they're filled in the, with the Spirit, but it doesn't say that they either spoke in tongues or prophesied. It just sort of leaves it to your imagination because it says that people saw that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Um. Anyway, to go on with my story, this boy started talking to me about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, we ended up sitting in my truck in my truck in the front and uh he prayed for me and the verse I can remember he talked about is over in um the gospels and it says if we ask the Father for the Holy Spirit that he only gives us good gifts. And I can't tell you where that's at at the moment. I could look it up. But anyway, we prayed that, and I said, Holy Spirit, fill me up. I knew he was already in me. I just didn't think I had all of him, which obviously probably it didn't. But I heard it sort of came from deep inside. This word just sort of bubbled up and splashed on the bottom of my brain. Now, I've seen a lot of people in my time, and I've prayed for a lot of people to receive the filling of the Holy Spirit. And I've seen it happen and take place in different different ways. I've seen some people go to speaking in tongues like some lawnmower, you know, cranked up and went off. But uh, in my particular case, I only got one word. And this word was end of the seda. I mean, I can remember it 30 years, 30 years later because that's the only word I had for so long. I wore it out and then I got one more. <laughs> And then eventually, it just sort of developed right on into a language, one language to another language. And uh, then I began to be able to sing in tongues. And But what I have found is that in and through all of this, that the Holy Spirit is a gentleman, even in the working of miracles, the gifts of faith, the power gifts, they come through the body of Christ. They come through us as individuals. But we must choose to agree with the Holy Spirit to operate with Him. Otherwise, we actually can grieve Him. Because He's not going to, you know, like in my case, He didn't knock me over the head and make me speak in tongues. And my experience has been through 30 years, 35 years, that He doesn't do that. You know, some people are just more, um, what's the word, loose as a goose than other people. Some people are just more uptight than others. I guess I was one of those uptight ones. But, you know, God knows how to operate with our personality. And even when I've seen, I've had gifts, gifts, again, is in the plural of healings. I can remember a fellow... One time I was going to a nursing home and and speaking to the old people in the nursing home. And this guy, I got in a conversation with him outside after the service was over. And I don't even remember exactly what it was, but something was wrong with him physically. And it's been so many years I couldn't tell you. But uh, anyway, I ended up praying for him. And when I did... It was like I was looking at the inside of him, and some kind of essence or power, if you would, came out of me, came out of my hand, and went into him, and he was healed. Now, I wish I could say that happened all the time. Mm, It doesn't, but it actually happened. I had another incident which I'm going to classify as a working of miracles and or gifts of healings. I don't know exactly how. Like I said, these things overlap. I've been married to Beth for about four years. And uh, I was laying in bed one night 
And those of you who know me know that Beth has some health issues that we we are struggling with. But I was laying in the bed, and I heard the Holy Spirit say, put your hand on your wife's left leg, and I will grow it out. And I'm thinking, now, if I've ever heard anything that's sort of different, this is it. And... I, you know, I obeyed because I trusted that I was hearing correctly. And, folks, I'm going to, I'm going to be honest with you. When it comes to these things, sometimes, you know, unless God's telling you to jump off a roof, you might as well just trust Him to see. What was the alternative? Not to, not to do it? Mm-hmm. I ain't stupid. You know, what was going to happen if I didn't do it? Nothing was going to happen for sure. So, you know, I don't know how what that means about my faith, really, but this is actually an operation of something other than my faith. One is a word of knowledge, because he said, put your hand on your wife's leg, I'm going to grow it out. I did not know that Beth had one leg shorter than the other. I'd been married to her four years, I had never come up. I laid my hand on her leg, and sure enough, it grew out. I did not know that that leg was shorter than the other one. Now, that's a supernatural gift of working of miracles or healings, maybe both of them. Now, one of the things I'd like to emphasize in this is these gifts of the Spirit mentioned in the 12th chapter of the book of Corinthians operate as He wills. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to profit with all. But they only operate as he wills. They don't operate when and how we want them to operate. You know, if I'd have had my choice, I'd have done something different. Now, why did God heal her leg and grow her leg out, and she still struggles with fibro, pain every day of her life? Well, all I can say is a Greek term, not a Greek term, I'm sorry, a Latin. The Latins used to use this phrase, dies absconditus. And interpreted in English, it literally means a hidden God. His ways are hidden from us. We will not, and especially where these gifts are concerned, you know, we will not truly understand all that there is to understand about them. It's like I was trying to sort of get across the point earlier. One might have a word of knowledge, uh, know something about a situation, it can come along with prophecy, and it might turn out to be in several paragraphs that you're able to speak to that person, including that portion of supernatural knowledge. And that would be the gifts of prophecy and knowledge, or the prophecy, knowledge, and words of wisdom combined. One of the things that I think it talks about in Corinthians is that uh, God is desirous that we all prophesy. So prophecy, out of all of these gifts, seems to be one of the the one gift that God says we should um, desire, that we should seek after. And um, so I have, you know, most of my life sought after it. I've been desirous of it, and it has come and gone. There have been times in my life that uh, I literally could kind of people. And God would put something on my heart for each person in that line. And I've done that. And there have been other times, sometimes for years, that God didn't seem to put anything on my heart for anybody else. And so, I might also mention this as a thought, too. Um, Because one operates in a gift of prophecy, or has that operate through them, does not mean that they don't themselves have to walk by faith. Um, I was at, uh, we went to a conference this last weekend, and I'm not purposely not going to tell you the name of it because I'm not particularly endorsing them. But they have a Bible school uh, attached to them. And as we walked in the door, a lady caught Beth and said, Thus saith the Lord. 
And it really, what she had to say really blessed Beth. But they also have this prophecy encounter kind of thing where you go in and you sit down and they've got three or four people and they seek the Lord to see if he's got anything to say say to you. Well, I thought that would be interesting, so we went went to that. And these three people are sitting at this table and they have this to say and that to say and this to say. Well, I'm going to be honest with you, they were, they were wet behind the ears. Not a thing they had to say had anything to do with the Lord. Now you say, how do I know that? Because none of what they said bared any witness with me whatsoever. Had nothing to do with my life. I couldn't see any connection with anything they had to say. So where did that come from? They made it up. (laughs) So, you know, even in the best of times, a person, you know, can... um, so let's use the word miss it. It's like when we're in our doing our online group calls for deliverance. You know, a name like Amodius, I mean, you just can't hardly make that up. But let's say that I'm thinking about lust and I call lust out. Well, did I hear that from the Holy Spirit or did I make it up? Well, in that kind of an encounter, it doesn't really hurt anything if I'm wrong. It's much better that I reach out there and try to be sensitive to what God's saying uh, than it is that I hold back. And, you know, I'll give these people in this conference, you know, the the kudos for attempting and trying. But I think they're sort of missing the boat in the fact that these gifts of the Spirit operate as the Spirit wills. And on all of my years, almost 35 years or more now of Christianity, I can count on one hand the personal prophecies I have had. I have had. And I think that's unusual because some of the people I know that run in the circles that I do have a lot of them. But God just doesn't seem to do that toward me for some reason. And even though a lot of times in my life I've had God put things on my heart to speak for other people, I've never found that, you know, it lessened the call that I had to walk by faith. Often when I speak of what God puts on my heart, what I look for in prophecy, words of knowledge or words of wisdom, is that it confirms what's going on in that person's life, that it encourages them, they have a witness to it. And if they don't, then I sort of reconsider, maybe I'm missing it. But, you know, I wouldn't give my totally hard time if I didn't get it 100% right, which brings me to the uh, question of visions. There are several types of visions. There are open visions where your eyes are wide open. That happened in the book of Acts to Peter. And there are visions where your eyes are closed and you have a vision, you see something. Now, visions can carry words of knowledge or words of wisdom. Depending on, you know, are they telling the future? Are they futuristic? Are they imparting some kind of knowledge? of a circumstance or a thing. Uh, and the vision might even be a discerning of spirits. You could see a devil or a demonic being in a vision with your eyes open or your eyes closed. That would be a discerning of spirits. If you had a vision that entailed something that you couldn't know yourself about a person, that would be a word of knowledge. Um, I had a one of the prophecies and words of knowledge mix that stands out of my mind that I think because of the the fruit of it in my own life that comes to mind is I was in a in a church one night and there was some kind of a fellowship group or something and uh, please don't ask me to do this because the Lord's not doing this right now thank goodness but at this particular time. If I gave a prophecy, I had to sing it in tongues and then interpret it. 
And, you know, that takes a lot of faith. So here I go. And, uh, you know, here I go with the uh, the interpretation of it, which tongues and interpretation equal prophecy. And uh, all I remember is it was something about Jesus coming to this girl, skipping over the mountains in a hurry to you know, to hold her in his arms or whatever. I don't, you know, I don't even remember, but the girl breaks down in tears and gives her heart to Christ. I had no idea she wasn't even a Christian. And that's what tongues and the interpretation of tongues are for, are sign gifts. They speak primarily to the unbeliever. And this was a dramatic case of where, you know, I certainly had no idea she was even an unbeliever. I knew nothing about her. Um, so that's one example of that. So I think we've covered at least an hour's worth anyway. So let's open the floor for questions. Hopefully I can answer them. What questions might we have? <laughs> 